the studio at That Nerd Show. I'm Marcus Blake, and joined with me is Mr. Alex Moore. How you doing, everybody? And Miss Chloe James. Hey, guys. Welcome to uh, our interview series, where we interview filmmakers, uh, artists, and creators uh, from within the nerd universe. Uh, today, joining us is the lovely Tracy Lehman. Hello. <laughs> so... When you eventually see this broadcast, uh, we didn't get to go live. Uh, we want to give a big shout out to Skynet, who is affecting our live broadcast. Uh, but hey, we're recording it, and we will recut it later for the internet. Um, but anyway, today uh, we are talking with Tracy Lehman about her film, Ghosted, as it is showing at the Women's Texas Film Festival this weekend in Dallas, uh, one of the many film festivals that have turned to the virtual world uh, to try to have a film festival since theaters really aren't open. You know, welcome to the pandemic in 2020. So this is how we do things um, regarding film. Uh, anyway, a uh, couple of uh, quick uh, things. Uh, Tracy, I didn't really have anything uh, that was sort of ghosted, except a Ghostbusters t-shirt. That's my thing. <laughs> as, as a, uh, That's you so know, great. yeah, as a nerd t-shirt. Um, anyway, uh, getting into uh, your film, uh, again, we'd like to thank you for uh, joining us today. We had the pleasure of interviewing you a couple of years ago at the uh, Women's Texas Film Festival uh, with your film, uh, Mixed Signals. And I noticed something on social media. You were talking about the fact that it ended its film festival run, and now you've moved right on in, into the next film. Um, so... How does that feel? I mean, it's like you've gone from one thing to the next without skipping a beat. Uh, it feels it feels pretty good. You know, I, I kind of have a team now so we can kind of do these together. You know, it's nice when you're all alone, completely alone. It's really hard. It takes a lot longer. But um, luckily, I have people I can work with again and again. And, and we can kind of do I can they can help me create them almost as soon as I can come up with them. So that's that's a dream come true. It took a while to, to find them, you know, but luckily. Uh, well, and this has got to be you know, a strange time uh, for filmmakers uh, with everything that's going on and basically, you know, America kind of being shut down. Um, but luckily, you had this film already done in the can. And did you, uh, were you done with all the, uh, the post-production work by the time all this started? We were. I had a longer version. The version you saw, I think, is 15 minutes. I had a 19 minutes. I was like, wow, this is so cliche. My 19 minutes director's cut that everybody's saying is too long. You know, it was just pretty much the exact. You know, I was like, it's not too long. You know, and then and then uh, you know, there are all these like gems that I didn't want to cut. And um, the pandemic kind of gave me a little time to go back and be like, okay, could I cut these? You know, and then I I and when I cut them out, I'm like, it's got a better flow. You know, it's yeah, <laughs> I, killed my, I killed my babies, but for the sake of of, of it, you know, people liking it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's been so weird trying to uh, uh, deal with everything. And I've talked to so many filmmakers and writers. And I'm like, you know, how are you surviving? Well, you're getting more writing done. Or you can be home editing now. And, you know, I feel like there's still a lot of work that's getting done. Um, you're just basically doing it at home. Right. And maybe one day you'll get out of your pajamas. But most days it's like... <laughs> Um, at, least, at least from the waist up. We were pajama pants all day, every day. Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> well, that's that's one of the things that I love about Zoom is, eh, you don't have to wear pants. I mean, I'm wearing shorts, but it's like, eh, that's <laughs> all like from the waist up. <laughs> I think when we do our Saturday morning podcast, everybody's like, well, we have a t-shirt on. That's that's about as far as we're going. We have clothes-ish. You know, sometimes, yeah. so... Um, I, I am getting a lot of writing done just to, 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 to say that it is a great time. Like in the very beginning, like in March, I was like, this is a dream come true. You know, it's like, <laughs> like no one is expecting much of me. I can just stay at home and write. And, and then about a month into that, I was like, I'm lonely. I want to see somebody. This is horrible. My eyes hurt from zoom. Like, I was just like this, okay, this dream come true is kind of a, uh, is it going to ever end? You know, but um, I think I've kind of found a routine now of like, you know, we all kind of find like routines of how to like make it all work, you know? Right. Well, 
I feel like in, the, in this day and age now, you're really looking forward to those script reads where they're going to tear you apart. It's like, but I get to see people. Exactly. <laughs> I get to interact. Exactly. I'm like, I, if the audience doesn't like it, that's fine. I had an audience. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, well, let's dive into your uh, film. Um, first of all, I want to say that I love the I love the metaphor behind ghosted because you immediately think it's about, you know, actually being ghosted and them never talking to you again after like a first date or just ignoring you. And then you realize that it's something kind of different. And we're trying not to give away spoilers. Um, but my first question is, how did you come up with the idea uh, for this film? Um, for this one, I... A couple of years ago, I, was, I fell in love with someone and, and we, were, we were dating. I mean, it didn't last that long, <laughs> but, but I did fall in love with someone. And, and, uh, and it felt like they were always stuck in the past, like actually felt like the ex was in the room, you know, because the person was so uh, just, just not ready to move on, you know. And, and, um, and I, I talked about it with him and things like that. But then um, I thought, well, I can't just blame someone else. I, I, what am I bringing to this, you know? And I thought, oh, I'm bringing a lot of my baggage, you know? Like I have a lot of baggage that I carry around that I bring into every relationship probably. So, so I tried to like, just make it all literal, you know, so for the sake of entertainment, like, oh, cause I, you know, I've, I've been in acting classes too, where uh, as a director, where sometimes we'll put um, another character, say, say two characters are talking and they're talking about a third character and I'll have someone stand <laughs> uh, to represent that character in the room, you know, because then they can feel it, you know? And, and so I thought, well, I'd like to doing that in class. And I thought, well, I'm just going to do that, you know, literally have the ghost, you know, his ex, the ghost of his ex, um, just so that the log line of the story is basically like a woman with a lot of baggage falls in love with a man haunted by his past. And right. that, literally, literally she has a lot of baggage that she carries around and literally he's haunted by the ghost of his ex as they're trying to fall in love, you know? And, uh, and so I just, I just did that. I'm like, and it was really fun picking out the bags and, and, and figuring out how the ghost would interact and what, you know, you always have to have a line of consistency. Like when did, when is she clean? When is she not? Or how does this, you know? So, um, so that's, that's where I came up with it. And I, uh, my, my, the person I dated saw it and liked it. So I'm like, okay, I, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Art of the <attending> life. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, it's funny because I remember talking to you a couple of years ago about big signals about how that came about from a date. And uh, I feel like when you have those experience, you know, writing and showcasing them, showcasing them in a film is very cathartic. Kind of, it's like your own little therapy of working totally. things out. Totally. O often in my life, I'm trying to hang on to something I learned. And 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 because I'm like, if I can learn something, you know, from this situation, then Maybe other people can too, and maybe I can make it entertaining instead of the, you know, the misery I went through or whatever. So, so right. uh, that's kind of why I've been making these pieces that they inspired by my dating life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alex and I uh, actually share a lot of funny stories. I think him and I are the ones that have the worst date stories on our staff. So it's like, what do you do with them? Well, you make jokes about them, and right. eventually they, you know. It's it's a creative process. Um, anyway, Chloe, Alex, what did you jump in here? I know we all saw the film yesterday. I personally really loved it. I love the metaphors. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll start with you, Chloe. Uh, what did you really like about this film? Um, I love uh, as yeah. Uh, if you guys have read any of my uh, reviews for like films, I really love. I love like a a really whimsical fantasy kind of feel, which was my absolute favorite part of this movie. I mean, well, besides the metaphors, of course, too. Like, you um, kind of like wrote it and directed it like it was uh, almost a fairy tale. But, you know, yeah. for, yeah, grow we, we, for we, sad grown-ups. <laughs> thank you for noticing that. Yeah, we, 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 uh, <laughs> Adam, you mentioned the poster. Adam Blaine Dix, who did the poster, who's a great um, illustrator. He does a lot of animation. Mm -hmm. And he used to be my downstairs neighbor. Oh. And that's how we met. And, and we would talk about character, like, like we have a drink or something. We talk about character, like when he used to live down there, then he moved in and he was still doing animation. I said, Hey, I want to do this story. That's kind of like animation. Would you ever be interested in live action? And so he came on to help with the art direction. And, and so we were really trying to, to keep that kind of fan, fanciful, almost animated feel throughout it. So. Yeah. I, I get to see that, especially with like the use of lighting, like, the, I don't know. 
something about the lighting was just very like did remind me of like an illustrated book like kids book or <laughs> a cartoon so did you see the little um lights in the fit in the, the fairy lights in the jars mm -hmm. did you notice those? um so we were we were shooting that in this little house and um it wasn't quite magical enough yet, you know, it, was, it just needed something else, you know, and, and the gaffer, came, you know, the, the lighting guy came by and he said, what if we just put, um, you know, it's really kind of an art department and lighting thing, you know, but he was like, what if we put fairy lights in the jars? And I didn't quite get it right away. And then, and then he explained it. And I was like, oh, wow. And we rushed and, and got those. And, and um, so that's, that was an example of teamwork there to pull that off. But I love those fairy lights in the jars. I'm, I'm, I'm a dork about it. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's certainly a very mystical feel about okay. this. I I feel like that's kind of how relationships are when you, you know, you really are attracted to someone, you really like someone. There's that period where everything is just kind of mystical. And, you know, if you love film, you're running through these scenarios in your head where you, you feel like it's the perfect meet cute. And, you know, you're, you're imagining scenes from movies about how it feels and stuff. Um, and we're all like huge into fantasy. So, I mean, when you're dealing with fairies and lights and stuff like that, it really adds a whole other dimension of this mystical feel to it. So, I actually, I agree. I thought that was pretty brilliant. Alex, what about you? I, you are the, he's the classic nerd and the really hardcore critic. Yeah. <laughs> I gave him a hard time. I am time. actually the animation slash fantasy nerd, so that's why I love him. That's true. I, I, yes. <laughs> Our uh, animation fantasy uh, nerd over here. But like I said, Alex, uh, him and I always go back and forth when we talk about movies. Uh, he's a little bit harsher th than I am, but we love really independent things and stuff. Alex, I know you can appreciate this movie in a lot of ways. Uh, what did you enjoy about it? Well, the first thing I had noticed about it was, you know, going back to sort of the look of the movie, it reminded me of some of these vibrant uh, films like Amelie or something by Guillermo del Toro that we've seen recently, which always have a great visual appeal to them. There's bright colors, there's uh, something uh, very uplifting and charming about the music. And uh, so I, it made me wonder about like some of your influences in terms of filmmaking, but I was also curious about the music by Harlan Hodges. And then it said there was some uh, additional music by Travis Warner. So I was curious about that, uh, the process with that as well. That's that's such a great question. I'm so excited to answer it. So, um, um, well, if some of the influences were in like in the lookbook and, and were Amelie, um, some Wes Anderson, even though I'm not, I don't always <clears throat> go for Wes Anderson necessarily, but the vibe, some of the vibe of the innocence, like Moonrise Kingdom or something like that. are gorgeous all over. Yes, completely. And, and, and the one point perspective and things like that. Um, and then, um, you know, another influence was uh, Edward Scissorhands. Um, yes. <laughs> because, you know, when she walks in, like the ice dance, you know, the ice dance in the movie. And yeah, and when she walks into the house, I wanted the feel of like her walking into the, you know. Um, yeah, I love that so much. Um, anyway, uh, I'd worked with Harlan Hodges um, a couple of times. And um, we, we really work well, well together. And then, and we were looking at like, not this is movie isn't la la land but like kind of like that kind of feel with the theme you know and and uh he just came up with that theme for stacy and i was like that's it this is amazing and and i we had been trying to find a sound for the ghost because she doesn't speak so the only way to really know how she's feeling is kind of like her theme you know or, or a sound effect or something that would follow her and um and so harlan actually constructed the whole movie without the ghost sound first <laughs> and 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 I heard it and I was like oh no where's the ghost where's where's the you know we have because that's that's we need to hear that it needs to have an arc it needs to you know and also right. it's some almost like the playfulness and the pathos like she's this sad kind of feeling of the past you know and they 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 were supposed to be competing the the yeah. current love and and the past you know the sadness of the past and nostalgia of the past and and so he he did all that amazing work and then i was like wait we need the ghost and he was a little bit busy on another project and and so we reached out to travis warner who i knew for a while and and i said hey travis uh we need to put this whole ghost sound throughout but we already have a score you're gonna have to like work within what's already set up and and find a way so it doesn't feel like two com two different composers you know 
So I have to say, I was so impressed. He came in and just, I, I was really worried about it feeling like a, like we were Frankensteining something, you know, um, that, you know, like just pushing it together. But uh, I, I think I could say it was one composer and I think nobody would really think twice about it, you know. Um, so uh, yeah. the, the shrilling scream that she has at that moment in the film. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would never name names during a broadcast, but I kind of had a little PSTD from past relationships with that. I'm like, you added a nice little horror element, though, to it. <laughs> right. There was like two names in my past that I immediately come up with that. I'm like, ah! <laughs> I got over it, though. You don't have to worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> that was but, my... No. Oh, sorry, sorry. That, that was my first Texas switch-up. Do you know the Texas switch-up? The shot? It's, no. in, it's in horror films a lot where, where um, and stunts, where some, the actor or the performer will, will kind of run, like some, in stunts you might have the, ac the actual actor run towards the camera, they run around the camera and the stunt person runs off. So mm. and they do something crazy. And you, and, but in horror, you'll, they'll do it a lot where like they pass and someone's not there and then they go back and then they look and the person's there or, you know, and so okay. to do that that kind of one or Texas switch up shot. She, we were running around and you know, it was like, oh wow, I wish, I'd, I, wish I had like a time lapse of it or something, you know, it was kind of, kind of fun. <laughs> That's what that thing is called. <laughs> yeah, Texas switch up. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so you were talking about your accents. This is loosely uh, based on, uh, he actually liked it, didn't give you any grief over it? No, I mean, I think it made him a little sad. <laughs> <laughs> but he liked it. He was glad that I made it. <laughs> you have good enough terms to, you know, show them your movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have, I mean, it's like, I want to be honest. It's communication. I'm not trying to exploit anybody or anything like that. And also, I'm like, she had a lot of baggage. It's not just him. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I really liked exploring that not everybody changes at the same time, too. You know, like, this is, it like, you kind of in in this fairy tale hap I don't want to give away the ending either, but like in a lot of situations, like people say, "Oh, everybody just instantly realizes everything at the exact same time," and that just isn't really how life works, you know. You can no. but you, you can plant a seed of something good with somebody; it doesn't mean it was a waste, you know. I want to ask you about narration. I I mentioned earlier in a message to you that I I am a huge fan of narration. I think if you get that right voice that really narrates a story. Uh, Robert Redford is probably my favorite like narrator. Yeah. Uh, and I think part of that comes from, uh, I'm a third generation fly fisherman on my dad's side of the family. So you can imagine how much we love the movie A River Runs Through It. And I grew up reading that book. But the fact that he narrates straight from the book and really tells this story. Uh, David Duchovny is another great narrator. Always loved when he narrated part of the X-Files. How how do you find the right narrator that fits your story? Uh, and I don't know who narrated your movie, but I thought I, it, it sounded like somebody that would do trailers, but also I've heard this before, like it feels very familiar. So how did, how do you go about finding the right narrator? Well, Jim Meskimen was our narrator and, and there really wasn't really, um, any other anyone else in mind because he's just so great and you know he can kind of do anything and I knew him and I'd worked with him on a live action piece years ago and and uh, I was just hoping that he would be available and do it because um, he can really do anything he does like he does, he has a show called Jim Pressions and he, he right. uh, He's, he's really, I mean, I've never seen anyone like it. There's one live piece online where he goes A to, a to Z doing celebrities and all in one take and uh, I, I'm like, how, how can you pop? And he did one for the pandemic about washing your hands and they did a um, deep fake where he's like, he's like 25 different celebrities all, you know, I'm just like, this is insane. Like, I don't, he's a genius, but um, we, he first, the first, the kind of, I said, can you send me kind of a scratch track so I can have it on set because I have to get the timing right, you know? And cause we do a lot of narration and then there's this kind of, um, element in this film or technique where I, I you know, if, if for humor's sake, they, the narrator says the action and then the actor does it, you know, or says the same thing again. And it's, you know, supposed to be funny. And there was a lot more. I cut a lot of it out when I cut those four minutes, you know. So, um, but, uh, uh, and so he sent me a scratch track and he sent me like a kind of Texan one and kind of like a, a really proper one. And I mean, they were all perfect, but I kind of liked the one that was just kind of straightforward. It was just kind of like this, 
this is almost like a documentary, you know, he's just, and, and uh, so he sent me that and, and I, I can't wait to, I mean, if I ever narrate anything, I think he'll be the guy because I think he can do anything. But it was tricky because I'd never done narration and I have a writing group and this is the honest truth of how I, the narration came to me in the script. I, I didn't know the lines for a couple places in the script. So I just put, um, like, like this, this is like, if people think this is, this is bright or, 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 you know, whatever creative, then I'm, I'm killing myself with this. But, but uh, basically, you know, this ice cream shop, she says, I say something cute and I say something cute back. Mm -hmm. I wish I had just thought of that. But what happened is I didn't know the lines. And, and so I just put in the script, I say something cute, I say something cute back. And then, and, and, the, and the writing group read it that way. And I was like, oh, I kind of like that. I'm going to keep that. And, and <laughs> that was the beginning of like, kind of breaking the fourth wall and, and just sort of like, you know, and then I was like, well, a narrator could, could tell this like a storybook and, and we were doing the animation. And, and so that's kind of how I found my way to, I didn't start there, you know. Right. Well, for me, that's the one thing that really stood out. I mean, I, I agree with Alex. Oh, I love the color. I love the animation feel to it. But again, I always go straight for narration. And when I write, you know, I talk things out loud because you, there's a certain rhythm to narration. If it doesn't sound good out loud, then it's probably not good on a page. So, yeah. and I want to ask, and I'll start with you, Chloe. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else? What really stood out in this film for you that you just absolutely enjoyed? Uh, Oh, well, let's see. I mean, besides like the kind of like the playful mixing of the genres, which I've already touched on, like, you know, he had that little brief bit of horror with, uh, I guess that, that was called the Texas switch up uh, effect. Yeah, the Texas <laughs> switch up. I, I was hoping to kind of like shock you with a little bit. I'm really glad that you mentioned horror right there because mm -hmm. that it was right. If, if it hadn't changed tone right there, then the movie would have been really flat. I think I, I feel mm -hmm. like I needed that kind of, you know, but um yeah, you like that. Um, I, I mean, yeah. Besides all 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 of the visual things and you know, the uh, genre switch ups, I really did like. Um, I, I need. I wish I could talk about more of the ending without it spoiling it too much. But yeah, yeah, we're not. Like other times, we're not trying to spoil something. Yeah, well, yeah. everything is not a fairy tale sort of ending. Yeah, <laughs> uh, things like this in real adult life. Alex, how about you? I mean, you always notice, uh, I think, a lot of things about film better than some of us do when we talk about it. What's the other thing that really stood out for you that you enjoyed about this film? Well, um, we kind of, we've kind of discussed it a little bit, but um, what, what I like is that, you know, you have, there's a lot of metaphoric symbolism about, you know, like, say, baggage and the fact that, you know, he has somebody from his past who's sort of, in the midst of this as well. But, you know, there's always, I'm always looking for what maybe some of the potential messages are. And I think that there were several here, but one that seemed to kind of get grasp me at least was that, you know, things aren't necessarily how they appear. You know, you, you have one person who's carrying a lot of baggage, another person who seems to be free. And then you realize that this person's not free at all. And this person who has all the baggage is, without giving too much away, seems to make more progress at some point, uh, mm -hmm. whereas the other person is still not able to quite get there. Um, and, you know, you touched on it earlier when you talk about everybody's kind of working at a different pace and at different phases of their life. And um, been through it often enough in my own life, you know, where dealing with timing is such an important issue. So um, it seems to sort of be coming around again in this story where it, sometimes people are good together, but it's just not the right timing. And so it doesn't really work. Yeah, so that's kind of what it looked like to me. You're dead on. Yay. Yay. I communicated something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we got, uh, this is kind of like our version of Inside the Actor Studio. We have some very important <laughs> questions for you. And we'll get to our nerdy question at the end. Uh, you know, it's a little bit different than what we asked you a couple of years ago. But I, since, again, you really base this on a lot of, uh, you know, former relationships and things that you've learned. Uh, and we can all go around. I have my own funny stories, but I'm curious to know, like the worst relation, like dating experience that you've ever had that may not have ended up in a film yet, but may one day end up in a film. <laughs> <laughs> I had, well, I have two. Um, <laughs> we all try to hurry, but one, one was out here in LA and the guy was so horrible. 
um, like he picked me up, which is nice that he picked me up, but then, but then he, as he said, oh, you had your writing group. This is years ago. And I've had my writing group here for years. And, and he said, and he, he said, um, I have a, a movie idea. And I was like, oh no, we just met like, this is okay. And then, and then, uh, <laughs> you know, because if you don't think the idea is the hard part, it's not the, the writing is the hard part, but, um, but, um, he said, uh, I, it's, it's like the king of comedy except except instead of comedy it's 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 a wannabe instead of a wannabe comedian it's a wannabe writer like you right oh. and, and, and and i was like oh. i was like i'm gonna make my living doing this i don't and did you just call me a wannabe writer and then and then he's like well don't take it like that whatever and, and he's like he's like you know and then anyway so it started like that then we went to the grove here in la and i was like did you buy the tickets or do we need to buy the tickets and he said uh, no, you can just, this is the theater, you can just walk in. And, and I was like, no, I need to buy a ticket. I'm a filmmaker. Like, I'm not going to walk into a movie theater without buying a ticket. Like, that's just not going to, and he, and he, so he walks in by himself. He stole his movie ticket. I was like, oh my God, what is going on? Then, then we get to concessions and, and there's, and, and he was like, do you want popcorn? I was like, maybe he'll redeem himself here. I don't know. I mean, it's beyond redemption. I just wanted to see the movie at this point. And then, and then, uh, uh, he, he said to the, to the concessions person, um, her name tag said Stephanie. And she said, he said, um, Hey, Stephanie, he said, we want, we want popcorn, but, but, um, we want a sample first you know and and i was like oh my god is this like a movie like this is like some horrible like quirky this is like like an evil <laughs> camera set up here <laughs> <laughs> and so so she gets i can see her, her gears turning she's like how do we give samples that cups are inventory i used to work in a movie theater like cups are inventory like you can't just give samples you know so so she gets a water cup which aren't inventory and she puts some samples i was like oh that's smart she hands it and you can tell she's kind of proud of herself and he goes thanks, Stephanie. And I was like, oh no, you know? So I said, thank you, Stephanie. I was like, thank you. Like I was trying to give her like, I'm not, you know? Anyway, this is near the end of it. I was like, we're just gonna go see this movie. I don't wanna talk to him. Obviously I'm not gonna see him again. And we go sit down and and um, I don't like doll up for dates usually. I like to like just be who I am, you know? Right. And he leans over to me and he said, um, why didn't you wear much makeup, you know? And wow. I was like, I was like, what? He said, didn't you want to impress me? And I was just like, I was like, <laughs> wow. I was like, I have to tell you, you're really rude. You're like really rude to everybody. And like, I, I like how I look. I don't feel the need to change. And he said, and, and, and I'm like, he's like, I don't, I'm not rude. I think fast and I say what's on my mind. And I was like, well, what's on your mind is really rude. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if you end that story with, Let's go back to my place. You have your serial killer story right then and there. <laughs> well, yeah, it's put like hard candy or something. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> that, wow. Oh, my God. Um, but now I, wanna, open, like, I really do want to see that as a film now. <laughs> or at least a PSA announcement. Man, this is how you're not supposed to act. <laughs> So so we dated for six months. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, honey. I, I kind of feel like that beats my. I met someone who <laughs> was schizophrenic and would go off her meds, mm. and she stood me up for dinner. And when I called her number, her husband answered. Mm. <laughs> and when I explained what was going on, his response: "Oh, she did it again." Oh mm. <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> Why is this an again story? Why does she have a driver's license, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but anyway, Alex, I don't know. I mean, I've heard some of your stories. Can you can you top something that? Um, I don't know, but I'd rather plead the fifth at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Chloe, we know you're wonderful. We know you don't have bad day stories like that. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, because uh, I have such good uh, taste in guys. <laughs> now my guys just get really, really bad. Like into the relationship, they hide it, and then <laughs> right. they just like slowly spring it later on with wow. their with their ghosts and baggage. <laughs> so, as a filmmaker, Tracy, what what films have inspired you to become a filmmaker? Um, I've had a few different phases, you know, er early on, 
like in school and as a teenager and, and in college, I, everything was tragic. Everything I did was so, I just thought, you know, I hadn't really figured out that you could be happy in life yet or how to get there or anything like that. And so everything in it, and I was so, um, I just wanted to show that part of life. I thought it was really important, you know, and, and, and I, and I'm glad for that phase, but you know, usually the characters that I was writing died usually of their own hand. Like it was just really, so, so I was really drawn to like Fellini and like, um, and then, and then filmmakers like Todd Solondz early on, like Welcome to the Dollhouse. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the Dollhouse was my, was uh -oh. changed my life, you know? Because right. it was, it, I had never seen anything like, I worked at a video store and somebody, somebody gave me a copy of it and I was like, what is this? And, and um, you know, it's really dealing with dark stuff uh, in, in, a, in a, you know, kind of like, I'm, I just, it changed my life. That's all I can say. And so, um, and so I, I had that period, but then, but then I got, I started watching like Annie Hall and, and like all, all pretty much all Albert Brooks movies, or at least like Lost in America and, and, uh, and um, Modern Romance for sure. I feel I can relate to that character, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> but uh, so I started watching things like that and, and I was like, okay, maybe I can tell, it, 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 I'm rambling a little bit, but my, my brother, I told my log lines to my brother about 10 years ago and, and they were like, woman shoots herself in the head and has to live with the scarring, you know, like a talent, this, this Spaniard becomes convinced something's growing inside of him and has to find it. And they all had these deep messages and they all were tragedies, but I read like five or six of them to him. And he said, Oh, you make comedies, you know, and he was joking, but the, it like a light bulb went off. And I thought, Oh, this, this, if I do this in a funny way, all of a sudden it's fresh and, and it has more heart. And it was around the time what? that, as a person, I was thinking, what do I want to put out in the world? Like, I can still tell these stories that have dark elements um, and, re and reality, you know, things we really need to learn and deal with, but I can do it in, with more heart and maybe with a little more in a way that kind of leaves you wanting to like change or grow as a person versus just like, oh, it's all shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. I don't know if I'm allowed to no, say No, no, we curse. Go ahead and curse. And by the way, uh, it's those kind of stories that tap into your inner Oscar Wilde. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was discussing uh, Oscar Wilde lines uh, with someone the other day about just the irony of lines. Uh, and he is the prime example of that. All comedy is tragedy, you know? Yeah. So. Absolutely. Plus time, right? Tragedy plus time. Is, yeah. Exactly. The other thing um, that we, uh, I just had to say one thing that, that, that um, Todd Haynes also was hugely influential for me because. Um, around the time I was working at the video store, I was, you know, I was a teenager and I was like, I don't have come from a lot of money. Maybe I can never be a filmmaker because it seems like everybody's rich and they have celebrity parents or whatever. You know, I didn't know how it worked. And, and someone, uh, I thank God for this colleague that kept telling me about these movies. And um, he slipped me this underground copy of uh, Superstar, the Karen Carpenter story. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was the made-for-TV movie, right? Well, it's like 40 minutes long. It never really got released. So it's in some ways... Oh, okay. I'm thinking of something but, different. Okay. Um, it, it, uh, he made it with Barbie dolls. And he, it, with Super 8 cameras and little dollies. And, and it's the story of Karen Carpenter and her battle with anorexia. But it's told with Barbie dolls. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it looked like it cost no money to make. And I was so affected by it. It was grainy and, you know, everything. But I was like, wow. I was like, this is a powerful movie. I was like, I didn't know at that time that he was, that he was or was going to be this huge filmmaker, but it, I was like, right. you could look at this piece and it's like, even if you had more money, this is the, a really powerful and important way to tell this story. So, of course, they had licensing issues and all that, you know, but, 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 right. um, but I, I thought, well, maybe it doesn't matter how much money I have or, you know, maybe there's a way to tell the stories no matter what budget I, I can come up with, you know? Yes. <laughs> uh, I think the Blair Witch Project, whether you like that movie or not, proved that you have a camera and some people that are willing to go out in the woods. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somehow you can, right. Absolutely. When it comes to women filmmakers, uh, which ones have inspired you? Um, I'm going to, I... I'm going to go with probably an obvious answer first, but then, I'll, but, but, um, so in 2010, I was with my brother and we were watching the Oscars and, uh, and I remember, you know, hoping that Catherine Bigelow would win, you know, but, um, 
I, I, and then she did. And, and I, I had a journal at that time. I'm writing it lately, but I still have the journal entry from that date in 2010 where, where I was talking about like how something changed, you know, and, and seeing her, it's not that, it's not that I think that she's necessarily the best filmmaker in the world, but she is really, really good. And the fact that she exists and has been able to do what she's done, um, it, it, it's, it's affected so many people like myself. And I thought, why could this have happened 10 years ago? You know, why did it, you know? Because representation is so important. You just, just to you to see yourself, um, you know, it's like, oh, it's possible, you know, like, um, so, but, but, you know, aside from that, I'm, I've been really influenced um, the last 10 years just so by um, Celine Sciamma, she's a French filmmaker. She did Portrait of a Lady on Fire and um, Tom Boy was another one. I think she's brilliant. Portrait of a Lady on Fire was probably my favorite movie last year. It was like, like out of control, amazing. But, um, and then uh, I've really gotten into Agnes Varda, um, but I, I wish I had gotten into her sooner because I think all my movies would have been influenced by her, you know? So uh, she's fantastic. Well, you, you talk about you know, why isn't this happening now and everything? Uh, Catherine Bigelow, love or hate the Hurt Locker. I mean, and the, the veterans on our staff, you know, will criticize that movie and all that for what it is, but it doesn't take away from her as a filmmaker uh, per se. But one of the things that we always love to talk about, especially to the misogynist assholes out there, so to speak, it's like, if you don't think women can't do action films, uh, then you're an idiot if you like uh, point Break, and we're talking yeah. about the good one. <laughs> the crappy remake. Yeah. Although the crappy remake wasn't that bad, but I'm sorry. It, it, it's we're, We all <laughs> love Keanu Reeves. Okay? <laughs> so it's like, come on, that movie is awesome. And the fact that it's a you know, woman filmmaker who did this great action movie, um, and, and all the characters are fantastic. So yeah. uh, to those idiots, I say, you guys are just wrong. You don't think they can't do it. So um, now our nerdy question. We, we changed it up. It's a little bit different because uh, we've already asked this before. You know, we already have it on record. But I am, I'm curious as a filmmaker, as we all are, if you had the opportunity to create a female superhero, their backstory, their mythology, who, what, what would you create? What kind of a backstory would you give them and what superpowers would you give them and their personality? Oh gosh. From beginning to end, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Our nerdy questions are always the hardest ones to balance. They're so good though, they make you really think, you know? Um, so I kind of sense, I, know, I love magical realism and everything, but I tend to start with the, with the grounded aspect and then work my way out to find like what magical way right. can you tell that part, you know? And so, so I, I'm going to start with the little more grounded part, but um, there was this um, article, I think a couple years ago called Woman in a Meeting. Did mm -hmm. you ever hear about it? Or, yeah. Um, and so it was like all the ways that like female leaders would have to say these famous quotes that like, like instead of, um, you know, tear down that wall, you know, it's uh, Mr. Mr. Gorbachev, if you don't mind, um, we'd really like to, uh, you know, da, 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 I don't know if you've considered this, but you know, and then it ends with like, what does the room think or something like that, you know? And it's just being all submissive. And, yeah. Yeah. and it, you know, it's, and, and there is, sometimes I find as, as a director and as a character in my own life, um, that I, I run up against these areas where I have to like quickly learn which way to communicate in the situation to get what I need, you know, whether it's, somebody has mommy issues and they can't deal with a female, you know, whatever figure or, or you know, authority figure or, 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 you know, another situation. Um, they're just not used to hearing authority in my pitch voice. And I've got to like lower my voice a little bit so that I can get their attention. You know, it's like some things are conscious and some things are unconscious, but um, so this is going to sound really strange and I don't know how I'd exactly work it into the, but I think a really awesome, funny and educational, like superhero or, or like mythical female leader would would draw attention to that like it's almost like a like a Deadpool style um <laughs> tone you know but with someone who like can can like analyze the person and all their biases like you know and then say like okay this will work with you got it done because you don't have time to like ta tap dance around and try different things and so this like 
almost maybe like I'm going very Hollywood here, but like a Charlize Theron style, like badass action figure, you know, in, in like a Deadpool type movie that can scan. And I, I went, I know I went more action than like, you know, maybe fantasy or mythology, but, but, uh, and, and putting her in the world in like real life situations where things need to change might be really awesome. You know, I don't know. That's, that's my, that's my actual personal goal is to like be that. <laughs> you had us at Charlie's Theron. We, uh, we kind of have this running joke at that nerd show. Uh, one of our staffers uh, who, uh, Julie Jones, who reviews comic books, does our podcast with us on Saturday mornings is really loves her. And, you know, she's also like, I don't think I could ever actually meet her or interview her in person because I would just want to take her home. And I'm like, yeah, kidnapping the celebrity doesn't really work. However, you know, there's an idea for a script out of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But it's like, she could do no wrong. Anything that she does, uh, you know, whether the movie, is, the movie will always be great because it's her. Yeah. Um, so it's like, I, I, I kind of get you. If, if I love your idea for a character. And if you're going to start with someone, well, obviously, Charlize, we would have to do yeah. it. <laughs> She's got such a resurgence going on, like the last, you know, I'm just like, wow, who told, like, did she come up with this idea to just play all these characters or, or did, did someone suggest it? Because it sure is amazing, you know, like just seeing what she's done the last few, you know. Well, I have this theory that uh, somewhere there was a developmental meeting about, we, we can do Sweet November too. That's a terrible idea. Keanu, I'm doing these movies called cool. John Wick. Why don't we do a female version, but put it in the Cold War <laughs> with a great soundtrack. I'll give you my trainers. And that's how Atomic Blonde came out. And we are all better for it. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, but I like the idea of your female uh, superhero. It's, you know, we tend to think of like really great superpowers like Captain Marvel or, you know, Wonder Woman and stuff like that. You're OP. But, in everyday life, being able to rearrange different things like you talked about uh, uh, and just make our everyday lives better, I think is sometimes a little bit more realistic. Yeah, the ability to, 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 to um, analyze and, and use people's biases against them almost, you know, to, to right. create the situation. It was like, like a, a stronger power of like heart, like in Captain Planet, and he, like everybody always makes fun of the heart kid. But, you know, I, I always defend like, no, that's the best power if you know how to use it. <laughs> right. Totally. Totally. I mean, to imagine the things that, uh, the wars that could be stopped if you just had this character whispering into men's ears and <laughs> using it. Yeah, I'm just saying. Uh, great, uh, great idea. I'd see it. Uh, and like I said, you know, we asked the question because it kind of gives you ideas for future writing projects. Totally. Now I'm already like, wow. Yay. Or, right, or, write or, that or, script. Or, I want to see it, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right. Uh, so final question, what is, uh, what is next for Ghosted? You're kind of on the film festival circuits here in Dallas right now. Uh, where's it going next and what do you plan on doing with it? Um, we, we got into LA shorts out here. So that'll, that'll, you know, I, I screen mixed signals there as well. So it's nice to come back. Um, and that's an Oscar qualifier festival. So that's great. Um, but they don't know if it's going to be in person or online yet. Um, it's, um, they moved it to October and I'm like, I just, I'd like to have, you know, there's, I, in one way, I'm so, so grateful that people are not canceling, but they're actually going online because we right. make these movies and want people to see it, you know, and, and I'm glad for the, Q, we have a Q&A on Saturday and, and things like that, but um, for, for this one, but for Women in Texas, but in another way, I'm like, please let me have one screening with an audience at least because you want that real time feedback, you know, of, of just, uh, is it working in, in some of my stuff with the comedic stuff? It's like, if, if they're laughing, it's working. Okay, you know, it's a tangible um, way to measure whether your movie's working. And if you don't hear that, it's not always, you know, or if you don't get the immediate response, you don't actually know if you communicated as well, you know. So, so I, really, I really do hope we have that in October. And then um, the producer and the cast and I have been talking about trying to do a feature version because um, it's COVID proof as well. You know, we have like one or two locations. It's it's three actors. Um, it's something we could shoot in maybe a couple of weeks. And and I definitely have enough source material to make it into a feature. So. <laughs> uh, well, I think it'd be very interesting as a uh, as a feature. Uh, so, you know, good luck with that. Thank uh, you. But, but again, the way that we're trying to do everything and trying to adjust to 
you know, the pandemic stuff. I mean, I'm hoping next year will be a lot better. We finally get to go back to the, you know, the theaters. But uh, to be able to showcase it in the ways that you're doing it is fantastic. Um, but anyway, so thank you, for everybody, uh, who will watch this interview. Uh, again, you know, we sorry that, we're sorry that Skynet affected our live broadcast, but we roll with it anyway. Um, and Tracy, thank you very much for uh, doing this interview with us. We look forward to talking with you again on your uh, future projects. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, Alex. And yeah. good luck with this film, uh, and good luck with uh, the LA Shorts for the Oscar qual uh, qualifier. So. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, and uh, you know, we, 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 we filmmakers, no one would even know about us if it weren't for you. So we really appreciate it. <laughs>